My message today is entitled, Be Strong and Very Courageous. Let's go to the book of Joshua. We're going to be looking at Joshua today. It's been a while since I have preached on Joshua. And looking at the first chapter, first three verses. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give them, uh, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. So I want to look at this for a moment to recognize that the statement was made, Moses, my servant, is dead. It is the end of an era. It's about to become the beginning of a new era. And when you have one that is like Moses, who has served God faithfully, it is a sacred moment when they go to be with the Lord. And so Moses, my servant, is dead. It hit with Richter points to those that were hearing it, not because they didn't know that Moses was dead. They knew that. But that God was speaking for something that was going to shift from the old and start with the new. Moses had been leading the Hebrew slaves out of Egypt. And we know that in Egypt they had uh, really hard taskmasters. So they are being led by this great deliverer of God named Moses out of Egypt, then through the wilderness and toward the promised Land. I want us to consider these things as speaking to us today. That God is also leading us out of something. What is that that God is leading us out of? And if we feel that we're in the wilderness, how is it that we can fully embrace and understand where God is leading us uh, toward? Up to the moment of Moses' death, the people had depended on Moses for everything. Now, these are people that we know built the pyramids, and yet here they are in the wilderness, and they just wait on Moses to do it all. Moses, speak to God. Moses, get us food. Get us water. Moses, take care of us in these ways. And as far as we can tell, looking at the scriptures, they never lifted a finger to help themselves. It was always a sense of, Moses, you take care of us. So with Moses now, Dying and it being declared, Moses, my servant, is dead. This is now a moment in which the people of God need to rise up in a whole new level of trust in God, of believing God to take care of their needs, of seeing God be on the move. And now I want to introduce to you Joshua. Joshua is a, uh, was an aide of Moses. Now he's being tapped in a very unique way, to rise up and embrace the moment that, that he finds himself in, that God is looking to him to lead the people of God, and they're not to be dormant. They are to rise up and themselves show leadership in the way that they enter uh, the promised land. Joshua was born in Egypt. Has anyone been to Egypt here by a show of hands? Okay, very good. I've been to Egypt as well. I remember the uh, mass transit, you know, those vans and buses coming by, and, and there's no door. You're just hanging out. There's so many people in it. As you go along, seeing the pyramids at night as they were lit up was one of my favorite things and memories that I have of being able to see all of that. Joshua was born in Egypt, and he had experienced oppression as a young man he had witnessed some pretty powerful things. And one of the things that he witnessed, when you think about what it is it in my life that stands out as defining moments, things that I've seen, things that I've experienced, well, Joshua had witnessed the parting of the Red Sea. Now, imagine that as being in your mind as to knowing the power of God and recognizing that God moves on our behalf. And so he had witnessed the parting of the Red Sea, his name in Hebrew is Hosea, and it means save. Hosea means save. Moses renamed him, and the name that Moses gave to him was Yehoshua. Yehoshua. 
And that in English is Joshua, but Yehoshua actually means Jehovah is salvation. So Moses made it clear that uh, from where the salvation or the saving comes. In other words, Joshua, you've got a senior partner and the salvation that will be the identity of what you'll be bringing as you lead these uh, ones that have been enslaved in Egypt, that have gone through the wilderness, and now a whole new generation coming up. You're leading them into the promised land. You will be known as the one who brings salvation, but the salvation that you bring will be the salvation of Almighty God. And that will be his identity. And he wants to point, Moses does, as he renames Joshua, or gives him the name uh, Yehoshua, the salvation of Almighty God, that he wants to point him to Almighty God because he'll need to know his God is there for him and fighting on his behalf. You need to know that as well. You need to know that your God is the God that fights on your behalf. There's a whole uh, chapter in the Psalms that is a battle chapter in the Psalms. And you find it that God is speaking forth that he fights on our behalf. That's who he is. I don't know what you're facing right now, but God knows what you're facing. And I want you to know your God is fighting on your behalf. That's who he is. That's what he does. And so in Joshua 1.1, 1, 1, we read that Joshua is son of Nun. Now, this is not stating that he's the son of a nun. This is not a scandal. This is not a nun uh, that is the mama here. Joshua, son of Nun. Uh, and so we start to learn and get a glimpse into his unique story. Again, we all have a unique story. Your story is not like anyone else in this room. You have a unique story that's like a fingerprint. It is unique to you. And then there is the meta narrative of God, the large S story that is Genesis to Revelation that comes all the way to the moment we're alive in today. And that's God moving in history, his story. And so as God does this, we see that God moves in our small S or a story, our small N narrative. He taps our DNA. So we learn that Joshua is the son of Nun, and we learn that his grandfather, Joshua's grandfather is a captain, the head of the tribe of Ephraim. And God uses that DNA that is in his story, and he does the same with your story. God has given you a family that if you look in the Bible as to what a family is, a family isn't just what you have around you right now. Maybe you say, well, my spouse is my family. That's my whole family right now. Or I don't have a spouse, but I, I consider that family of origin that I was raised through to be my family. Or I've got a whole family here, kids, grandchildren, wherever you may be at. That's how we tend to look at what is our family. But the Bible speaks of family in terms of at least four generations. And so if you think of Four generations, now you're thinking of your own parents, uh, maybe your kids, but at least your own parents, your grandparents, your great-grandparents. At least four generations is how the Bible lays out families. And so when we consider that, we wonder, what is God tapping that has been the obedience of our family that goes back to generations where we don't even know the person, but they were obedient? Or maybe you're the pioneer in your family and you're the first to have faith in your family and you're going to pass along the blessing. The Bible speaks to blessing and curses and speaks to those being generational. So there is, in my family, I can tell you that I'm the seventh generation straight of preachers. That wasn't a pressure to me because I wanted to actually be, uh, I wanted to go into politics. Uh, but God spoke to me at a retreat and uh, when I was a freshman in university and spoke to me to enter into the quote-unquote full-time ministry. Now, I can tell you we're all full-time ministers, but into the formal ministry. So that means my father was a preacher. He was. He was an evangelist. My grandfather was a radio preacher when radio was new. And he was the, what uh, was Los Angeles Magazine called the first of the great radio preachers out in Los Angeles. 
My great grandfather was a uh, was a pastor. My great great grandfather was pastor. I can keep going somewhere along the line. There was a relative I do not know personally who must have gotten on his knees and dedicated himself to God in a unique way. And we don't even realize the power of what that does when we make a commitment of the heart towards God, because it touches generations beyond us. And I believe that. For you and the decisions that you're making, that God is going to touch generations beyond you in your family should the Lord tarry, should Jesus not return in our generation, that we will maybe not even know grandchildren or great-grandchildren uh, that will be touched perhaps, or those that are spiritual children. In other words, they may not be flesh and blood, but we set forth in motion something. Seed was planted. And all of a sudden, there's good fruit to that seed. So the DNA is being tapped in Joshua's uh, uh, story. And his grandfather, a captain, head of the tribe of Ephraim, all of this a part of what is the larger story of God to bring Joshua forth as an aid to Moses and ultimately as the one that will bring the people of God into the promised land. In Joshua, the first chapter and the second verse, we read that Moses is dead. Now, Moses, his very name means, anybody know? Drawn out of. Drawn out of. And this is really the identity of Moses. And it can be seen in a couple of different ways in his life. So we're speaking to DNA now. We're speaking to those unique things that aren't in everybody's life quite in the same way. He, his name means drawn out of. Well, his mother placed him in a basket that she made, and she put him on the Nile River. Now, I've been to the Nile River, and I thought of Moses being that little baby being placed out on the Nile on those big waves, and it's a powerful river. And my experience when I was on the Nile was different than... Moses' experience when he was on the Nile as a little baby, I, I had a dinner cruise, and it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. It was a good dinner cruise, good dinner. Um, but here we see drawn out of the princess, the daughter of the pharaoh, sees this basket going by and has mercy on this Hebrew child and takes him in as her own. So certainly that is a part of this drawn out of, that others are having a part in the story of Moses. She's drawing him out of what would be certain death. And then we see another thing, and that is that Moses drew the Israelite slaves out of slavery, out of bondage, out of being harshly treated and disrespected. And he, Moses, was the great deliverer who was able to point them towards the promised land and lead them over the hills. I've been on those hills. And I thought about how it is that Moses didn't have a megaphone. He didn't have anything that was the high tech of today. I look at high tech stuff in this church, promoting this message to be heard and seen beyond this building. And all of that is incredible. But Moses didn't have all that. I've been on those hills to see where he could see towards the promised land, and I believe that was supernatural vision for him to be able to see the things that were ahead. And, uh, and very, very interesting with all of that as Moses is a part of uh, drawing the people out of an era of slavery, of not lifting a hand on their own behalf, of needing Moses to do it as they didn't really know how or didn't step forward to do it. And now we have a new era, and that new era is Joshua. Now, Joshua, by his calling, is in two. So here is Moses out of, and now we have Joshua heading into or leading into. And we can see that in the story of the calling and what God is speaking forth in Joshua. God is taking also in our generation, I believe, the church of Jesus Christ out of something and taking us into a whole new era. And I certainly have been praying this over Capital Life Church 
that we can be taken out of the era of COVID, out of the era of the great resignation, out of the era of tailor make it to, to me and easy or whatever else, and we will be warriors for God and rally cry the victory in the years ahead that our God is on the move. Do you know that the armies of the living God, they would rally cry the victory before they ever saw it, before they ever experienced it, because they knew who their God is. And that's what I want for us as well. We're coming out of something. And we're going into something. And what God has for you is very, very good. And so, think for a moment. Again, what is it that God is bringing you out of? You know, there's a moment in which at times there's just a, a healing and you know you've been healed. You've been praying for it. You've been desiring it. You've been, been, been crying out for it. But when that suddenly of a healing comes, oh, all of a sudden it's like, why do I feel that I've had a load of life just taken off my shoulders and I now have freedom? Or healing physically, or healing in a family. You've been asking, you know, you've been asking God to, to bring healing into your family, resolution. Uh, and, and, and that your family doesn't need to go through this struggle anymore of, of contention. And I can tell you when that moment comes where you know that the healing of God has just come on the scene, what a moment of grace that is to say, God, you're a good God, and you've been watching over my family all the while. And God, I do not ever want to let go of the idea that you move in the now and you will have the last word and it will be good. So we are moving, I believe, uh, out of identity that's been found in the past and into an identity that is found in the promises of God. I spoke last Sunday in regard to the promises of God, how many promises there are in the Bible and how there are conditional promises and unconditional promises. And if you didn't get to hear that message, you can go on site on our website and find it and listen to it. The promises of God are for you. So I can't imagine that, you know, if I were to to bring back this curtain and say, here are all the gifts that we have for you, and they're for you, that you would just sit back and admire them and then walk away. You would go up and open your gifts. Well, God has promises for us, and I don't believe that we should leave those dormant as we go through life never experiencing all of them. I want to know what the promises of God are and I want to be able to declare them over my family and over my generation and certainly over this church. So here you are at Capital Life Church. You're being prayed for. We're believing God to stir up Holy Spirit activity. And we believe for the high water mark of the Holy Spirit that we're going to know the goodness of God in the land of the living. And God's promises are true. Joshua 1, 2. Joshua and the people must get ready to cross the Jordan River. Now, this is not the type of thing where God speaks and then you just smile and say, oh, God, that feels so good to think you're bringing us across that river. And we just sit back and watch and wait for him to do it. That's the background that the Hebrew slaves knew. But now Moses is dead. He can't call upon God to do the, all these things for the people. They need to rise up and begin to see that they're a part of this story, that they have leadership, that God has a calling on their lives. So it's not a sit-back moment and let God. It's a moment of saying God has spoken, now we obey. Now we are an army that marches forward. The Jordan River, the scholars say that at this place and at this time, we're talking about 12 feet deep. And 50 to 75 feet across and rapid waters. That's different from where we were at in the Jordan, where we were doing baptisms, we would have been carried away. But this is what we have in history of this moment. The Jordan River is where, and I'll give you a little background on it, we all know the prophet Elijah, we all know the prophet Elisha, and how they were powerfully used by God. Well, Elijah went to heaven at the Jordan River. And Elisha received what was a double portion of the anointing at the Jordan River. And I brought a little bit back at the Jordan River. I'll sprinkle it on you if you want it. Got it in my office. 
but there's something powerful that God was doing at this location. There was something that God was doing for, the, for his people. And Jesus was baptized, we read in the scriptures, in the Jordan River. Joshua and the people are to enter a whole new dimension of faith. I want this for you. It's not about church attendance anymore. It's about coming together to believe God to do great things, not only in our lives, but the ones on either side of us, in front and in back of us, in the family of Capital Life, and in the family of the Church of Jesus Christ all around the globe. In verse 2, God states that they will be entering the land that I am about to give them. Now, this is a promise of God, but is not yet a possession. So the, promises, uh, the promise of God is there. God's going to give it to them. It's going to happen. He won't be one that goes back on his word. You can count on it. But it's not yet possession. Verse 3, God states that he will give Joshua every place that he sets his foot. Now, I held to that scripture when we first moved out to the D.C. metro area. Uh, and we moved out on September 1st, 2001, right before 9-11. We would go into the city, and we would go into the gallery of the House of Representatives, into the gallery of the Senate. We would watch the members uh, of Congress uh, make their votes. We didn't know any of them at that time. We didn't know that we would get to the point where they'd be members of this church, or we would get to be friends with different ones. We, we were simply above them watching and praying. That was a prayer post. We'd go out on the steps of the Capitol, and we would pray. We would always be a part of the National Day of Prayer. We would go to the White House and walk all around the parameter of the White House and pray for the president and pray for all that serve the president, the vice president, the cabinet members. We do that to this day. We pray for our leaders because we are commanded to do so. We had no idea when we first came out that 9-11 was going to happen. We were praying in the Pentagon. We were praying down the halls of the Pentagon, never realizing that so many of those that would be making decisions in that building would be a part of this church. But we were praying and believing that every place that we set our feet, we would be able to possess the land. In other words, that God would give us those who would be hungry of heart for him, and we could be there at the right moment to share Jesus with them. We'd be there at the right moment. They already knew Christ to walk with them in their faith and to strengthen them and to let them know that they are not alone. Every place you set your foot, where are you setting your feet? We ought to be very, very proactive in being guided by God in regard to where we set our feet. We should never go with our feet in directions that are not of God, but instead to those places where God's heart is. That's why I love this. So many in this church have been those who have dealt with uh, and led in the cause of human rights and have been a part of taking apart what is, is happening with uh, with the, the sex industry and other things. We have them right here in this church making a difference. I praise God that every one of us have a calling on our lives to make a difference. And it may look different with this one than this one. This one, we may say, oh, they do something big. I just do small. I can tell you, small gets in places, big doesn't. Small will fit in places. You know how a little kid can get that key right underneath, you know, where it slipped in in the vehicle that we can't get in there and get because we're too big and that little hand goes right in there and snags. Listen, don't ever uh, underestimate. Don't let anybody look down upon you in regard to the role you have. You just be obedient to what God has given you. If we were in a war right now and we were placed in a three by three foot cell, there's not a whole lot we can do that anybody would seemingly applaud or say, wow, they're being used by God. We need to know that we are to be faithful everywhere that we are. Joseph was faithful in the prison system, and that's when God brought memory to uh, the cupbearer that he's in there and bring him before the Pharaoh, and he was able to save all of Egypt with the, uh, with the things that he did, the decisions that he made. And so when we look at all of this, we see the promise of God is, is being given here to Joshua. And, you know, they're going to face enemies. And they're not going to be able to just walk in and say, well, God sent us, so could you just leave now uh, where you have set up? 
uh, all that you're doing, but instead they saw giants in the land. And, and that's how they were described. That's what they saw in the circumstances they entered into looked like. Uh, the 12 spies, 10 spoke to the giants they saw in land. Did they see them? Yes. Yeah. Then why did Caleb silence them and speak something different? Because their focus was on all their circumstances and what they can't do. And Caleb said, silence, we are well able to take the land. And I love that. That's the spirit of a warrior. That's the spirit that was in David as he ran toward Goliath, not away from him. And he did so with just five stones, knowing that God could do it. God was the senior partner in it. So God's promise is there that he's going to give Joshua and the people the land. So it doesn't matter how big your obstacles are. It doesn't matter how many obstacles you have. It doesn't matter how you view those and how you feel like, oh, it just stirs my stomach. I can tell you, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And you are more than an overcomer. And God is on your side. And if God before you, who can be against you? And God states in verse 3 that as Joshua honors God's word, the promise given to Moses is now transferred to Joshua. I love that transference. Wouldn't we all love to have a transference of the anointing that's on a biblical hero of ours? And Moses was the hero of Joshua. Uh, Joshua had served him so faithfully. I can tell you we can put these great heroes of the Bible into stained glass windows and we can talk about them as if they're untouchable and so holy we could never be like them or we can see that God uses flesh and blood. They were flesh and blood. God is no respecter of persons if, and God is looking at you. His eyes run to and fro throughout the whole earth to find the one whose heart is completely towards him. And so God can use you in the same way as the way that God has used your heroes. And I think that's a pretty amazing thing to see. You don't need a reverend before your name. You don't need any sort of job description to look like this or that. Some of you are being used so powerfully by God that you don't even realize the full impact of how he is using you in the now. But he's doing it. That's good seed planted in good soil. So it doesn't matter that big the obstacles. God states in verse 3, but it's being transferred, this special anointing, calling upon Moses, upon now Joshua. And God's larger story, God's purposes, his, his plans will be accomplished. And just like the heroes uh, that we have in the scriptures, we can know that, hey, they had the same, uh, let me put it this way, this might be language you're not used to, but it's a biblical term, they're fallen angels. Those same demons that were after our biblical heroes are alive and they're after us. Those same obstacles, those same crises, they may look somewhat different. Ours may not be the parting of the Red Sea, but it is meant by the enemy to defeat us at the point of our faith, at the point of our joy, at the point of our peace. And we can't allow that to happen. So I want you to know that, yes, our great, great, great grandparents we're attacked by the same ones that are trying to attack us right now. But we can know what it is to say, wait a second. The enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus has come that we might have life and that more abundant. And that is what we have as our inheritance. All these people are doing is they're walking into their inheritance as they go into the promised land. That's what they're doing. And so we can know what it is to like Joshua, inherit the promises of God and to know that every place we set our feet. Now, in the land of Canaan, there are people, it'll take 14 years for them to be able to take the land. We think, well, every place you set your feet, it just means I set my foot there and I got it. But the reality is there's perseverance that is needed and those who walk in God's promises and persevere move forward. They never go back. I want to challenge you in that. I've known people through the years. I've been around enough decades and been in the full-time ministry enough decades to have seen ones that were on fire for God who had left the faith. And we need to always know what it is to move forward and never step back. 
Verse 5, no one will be able to stand against you, Joshua was told. And, and that's the same as with Moses. Joshua will know what Moses knew to be able to move forward in the things of God in that way. I challenge you to see yourself as walking with God just like your Bible heroes. Now, verse 6, God reminds Joshua that he and the people of God must be strong and be courageous. I speak it to you as an individual word. If we were to be right now in my office and we were to have time to talk about your life and where you're at right now, I want you to hear these words from the scriptures and from your pastor right now. Be strong and courageous. In fact, we see in the seventh verse that God steps it up. And it goes from being be strong and courageous to be strong and very courageous. So let's rise up to that place of being strong for our family and in our family to being very courageous in this uh, seemingly godless uh, you know, generation that we live in, meaning God is certainly here, but there's so much that's not of God and going other directions, and let's be strong and let's be very courageous. God states this three times in four verses. He must want us to hear it. He must want us to live this way. And then back in verse 6, we see that God told Joshua, you will lead these people to inherit the land. Again, there you go. It's a straight-on promise. And when God says it, you will lead these people to inherit the land, all of a sudden, it's not just about Joshua anymore. This is why I say there, that there are people on the other side of your obedience. There are people on the other side of your faithfulness. There are people that need what you will bring that are the, on the other side of your ability to persevere when you had the air knocked out of you, when everything seemed to just be dark instead of light, where you had questions and you didn't have all the answers. In fact, you were grappling for any answers. And all the while, in the midst of that, you stayed true to God. And now watch God use you. Watch God do what only he can do in and through you. There are those who will be blessed as you step forward in faith and as you honor God's word and his calling that is upon your life. Verse 7, do not turn from it to the right or to the left. This is speaking of distractions, speaking of detours, strategies of the enemy to get you uh, from being able to take the land that God wants you to take, from inheriting the promise, from seeing the fulfillment of the promise. But I want to say to you, and I challenge you in this, do not be deterred by your past. There are certain things that are in your past that would try to get you to believe that God will never greatly use you the way you've seen others be used. Do not be deterred by your past. Do not be deceived by that. Instead, move forward. Do not be deterred by your task, by what God has given you to do because it looks too big or too difficult or nobody else has ever been able to do that in my family. Nobody's ever done this. They've never gotten a degree. They've never been able to have a, a marriage that really was able to be everything I'd want it to be. All the things that would be there, do not be deterred by anything that is there in your past or in the task that is ahead of you. You are anointed by God to be the healing of the breach. You are anointed by God to be the one that is the very link in the midst of a DNA that has gone through generations, you bring the healing. You bring the hope. You bring what God and only God can do through a vessel that is completely submitted to him. If the enemy has tried to deceive you, you can speak to the enemy and say, be gone in Jesus' name. And I speak that over your life. The enemy must flee. The Bible says that our God, do you know, this is so powerful. There's a battle that battle psalm that is there of David's, and God speaks to the fact that he is the God that fights our battle on our behalf. He fights the battle against those who would try to come, come against us. They will not succeed in trying to do so. And in Exodus 23:20, God said, See, I am sending an angel before you. 
to protect you on your journey and lead you safely to the place I have prepared for you. Do you know that in worship time we sang about angels? In more than one song we were singing about angels. I believe that God's resources are far beyond our ability to ever even comprehend. God can send an angel in the direction of that unsaved loved one who the family's been praying for but hasn't seen anything happen yet. God can send an angel if he needs to. God can do things that are in his resources to take care of you financially far and beyond what anything you would need so that you can be in abundance and you can be in a place of giving to others as they're in need and blessing what God is doing around the globe. God places his resources towards you, towards the crisis that you've been going through, towards the disappointments, towards challenges. He places his resources towards your calling. He gives you the anointing you need to walk into the office you need to walk into this week to be able to speak into situations where some of you are in jobs where, let's face it, it's not a godly environment. People aren't even thinking about the God that you serve and love. And yet the anointing of God is all over you to bring a presence that will cause them to be attracted to what you have and who you are and not even understand why they are. Rise to your feet, if you will. Job in the Bible who faced greater challenges perhaps than we could even imagine ever facing in our lifetime. He stated in Job 17, 9, the first part of that verse, the righteous keep moving forward. The righteous, that's who you are, keep moving forward. The name Joshua, we spoke about it in Hebrew and in the Old Testament, but do you know what that name is in the New Testament? Jesus. It's the same meaning that we see there. Jehovah saves. Jehovah is salvation. Almighty God is your salvation. So here we see is kind of a precursor of Jesus, the Old Testament, helping us to understand better what Jesus is about and what his heart is as he moves the people towards the promised land. Jesus is moving you and your family towards the promise the promises of God that he has spoken over your family. He's moving you in ways by which you will have a deeper level of anointing than you have experienced before. As you witness, you're going to see results. You're going to see God use you in a way of bringing wisdom into what is your place of work. That It didn't come from you, but those that are around you, including those above you, will recognize that wisdom is what they need, and they will favor you because of it. God is going to do great and mighty things in our midst. We're coming out of something. We can release it. We can let it go. Leave it in our past. Let's go ahead and forget about some things. The Bible tells us to. And instead, now, let us move into where God is taking us. A place of blessing. A place of walking with God to where we know His voice. And we're guided by His Spirit. And we know what it is to move forward in God's promises and His obedience.